Susan Pinker, we are here to talk about your new book, The Village Effect, how face-to-face -face contact can make us healthier, happier and smarter. A New York Times bestseller. I would like to start out though with a question about your previous book, The Sexual Paradox. Now, what led you to write your new book coming out of the last one? The last book, which looked at sex differences across the lifespan, revealed a puzzle that at the time I couldn't solve, or I only had clues, and that was this universal gender gap in lifespan of about five to seven years with women all over the developed world, the industrialized countries, living an average of five to seven years longer than men. And I had a clue that it was, had something to do with social contact because there was some research coming out of Sweden that said that people who got out more, had more social contact, had less rates of dementia and had longer lifespans. People who had more friends lived longer. And so that's where I started with this book. And I had an experience of being at a conference, much like the GDA conference we had yesterday, where a speaker talked about the one place in the world where men live as long as women, where the gender gap is almost invisible. And that started me on the journey of asking the question of the f what factors make the difference. And what answers did you find? Um, certainly, I found that in the certain areas of the Mediterranean called the Blue Zones, where people have a high degree of social cohesion, they tend to be isolated, mountainous communities. And in the particular ones that I investigated in Sardinia, people look after each other. There's a lot of social contact. And this is why I called the book The Village Effect. It's a metaphor for that kind of con contact, two types of contact, actually. Close, intimate contact of people who are there to take care of you when you need help, who can provide that important, intimate social support and the larger types of networks that we need to keep our marbles, to keep our memories strong. And that means members of our communities. So in places like Sardinia, other areas in the, in the blue zones, these are people in your community like the priest, the grocer, the owner of the bar, people who've known you your whole life and who help to form your community. But I use that village idea as a metaphor for the kind of villages that we too in industrialized societies can build around us to create the same effect. So in a way it's weird that you should um, have to emphasize the importance of social contact. Is it the strange times we're living in? I would say it's an interesting moment in social history because we've never been more connected than we are now through our devices, but we've never been lonelier. Say, the rate of living alone, solo living, has increased 300% in the last few decades. And people are seeing fewer people throughout the day. Um, they have fewer close contacts. Surveys tell us that in the 80s, when nobody had network devices, people had an average of three people they could lean on and depend on at times of trouble. And now we have fewer than two, and some people have no one at all to talk to. And this is alarming. So what it tells us is that not all forms of communication, not all forms of social contact are created equal. And the benefits of digital contact are, of course, obvious. They're fantastic at logistics and searching for information and analyzing data. What they're not as good at is forming deep, intimate human connections. And this is a basic human need. So you're arguing that it's not just about uh, uh, the lifespan, but also about uh, people's health. Exactly. And not just um, physical health, but psychological health and cognitive health, the ability to learn and retain information, it seems, as you said, weird that there would be a relationship between what happens between us and other people and how our brains function. But this is actually uh, 
the result of about 10 to 15 years of research in the new field of social neuroscience. And it tells us that our interactions with others have a profound effect on how we think and how we function day to day, not only now, but well into the future. And in fact, one of the surprises I discovered when writing this book is that it ha there are epigenetic effects of social contact, meaning it affects not only our generation, but future generations, which was a huge surprise to me. A lot of the information and the science in the book was fresh and new even to me. Could you give us an example uh, of how face-to-face -face interaction makes us happier? Sure. In fact, there's new information. It just came out in the New York Times today of a survey, a happiness survey of nations all over the world. And they found that there were several factors that predicted how happy people were. Number one was GDP, how much extra money people had that made them feel secure. And next came social contact, how many people they could depend on, how strong their intimate social networks were. And people ignore this, and it's a taboo to talk about being alone or loneliness, but it's a hugely predictive factor, not only, as we said, in terms of health and longevity, but also in terms of how happy we feel. And of course, if you're feeling happy and well-adjusted and relaxed, you're in a much better position to learn and to be productive at work, too. Well, one could argue that uh, a telephone call or a text message is also a kind of uh, close interpersonal uh, communication. Is that right? Does it have the same effects as the way we are speaking right now, face to face? Not at all. I mean, you could argue that, but you would be wrong. <laughs> because, you know, there isn't a lot of research yet, but the studies that we have that are emerging tell us that different forms of communication have a different effect. So I'll, I'll give you an example of a study that came out in 2015. So it's not in the Village Effect because uh, the Village Effect was already published, you know, had been published by that time. But it tells us that um, depression in older adults, mature adults, when, it, when they are depressed, what has an impact on them in lowering depression is in-person contact. Um, an email contact, texting contact has no effect on their depressed status. And there's, the jury is still out on telephone contact. They're not sure, they didn't find any significant differences. Other studies show that when teenagers are under stress, a text from their mother has no impact on their cortisol levels, whereas a phone call or in-person contact does. And, you know, we know too from, say, sports psychology, that teams that have a lot of physical contact, high fives and hugs and huddles and all of this kind of, I would say, not body checking, but physical body contact, have greater team cohesion and they score more goals. You see it also in the workplace, where if you have face-to-face -face contact, it predicts about 40 to 45% of the results of salary negotiations. So we really underestimate something that is, or has been until now, quite intangible. At the workplace, digital communication is dominating. There is little face-to-face -face contact. Now, where do you see the potential of personal, direct interaction in business? I, I agree that in-person contact is diminishing and for lots of reasons. I think people are more likely now to send a text or an email to the person in the office next to them than to get up and walk around and talk to them in person. And I think this is a mistake because we're learning that not only do we get this kind of boost of oxytocin, the hormones that are released when we're in person, but there's increased trust, sharing of ideas. And you can see it at the upper levels of management. When CEOs or people in the C-suite have important, complex decisions to make, they get on a plane. They don't have Skype meetings. They don't have FaceTime meetings. They actually spend the time and effort to travel to a different place. 
Why do they do that? Because they know intuitively that it has a huge difference. They can evaluate how trustworthy their negotiation partner is. There is more of a, a dynamic give and take. And I think unfortunately what we're seeing is certainly not only in business but in education, there will be a social stratification where the expensive commodity will be in-person contact and only people who are in the top echelons of power um, and financial earnings will be able to afford it. So people, for example, in business who have more power will have in-person meetings. People who are lower down on the food chain will be tied, tethered to their digital devices and or will have meetings by Skype. Same thing in education. I think people who can't afford it, and I write about this in The Village Effect, that in Silicon Valley, the top decision makers often put their own children in Waldorf schools where there are no computers. So, you, you know, we're talking about network engineers who are insisting that their children until age 12 or 13 have no computers in the classroom. Mm -hmm. Why? Because they're firm believers in the importance of interper the interpersonal dynamic in transmitting knowledge and in creativity. And I'm sure they've seen it themselves in the workplace. But at the same time, Silicon Valley comes up with applications to monitor babies in sleep or even to monitor uh, the elderly. What do you think about this development? I think that there's a place for technology in monitoring and evaluating social contact. I think the danger is assuming that it's a replacement for real contact. So I think it's very interesting to have apps or other kinds of technological developments that allow us to, say, parse the stream of speech as we saw yesterday in the conference with Beyond Verbal or some types of applications that allow people to understand social messages who have deficits, social deficits. It, to withdraw that would be to say, I think it's more natural for people who can't see not to wear their glasses. If we have the power to assist, we should assist. But I think the problem is that it's not a, a one-size-fits-all solution for all problems and for all issues. So I, we have to have a much more shaded understanding of where we should use the technology and where we need the in-person contact. Like certainly in development with babies and children and developing, say, adults, preteens, you need the in-person contact. It is critical. Our brains as humans evolved to interact face-to-face. -face. And we don't know yet what the impact will be of having children spend between 5 and 12 hours a day in front of a screen. We, we don't have that information yet. It's, I would say, a, a cultural experiment on a grand scale. But what surprises me is how many parents are allowing this to happen and how many schools are allowing it to happen. Now working for that book you traveled a lot, you did uh, a great amount of research. How did the work for The Village Effect change your personal life? It had an impact on my own habits, there's no doubt about it, because a writer has to have solitude and has to have quiet time. But as I moved forward in my research for the book, it became so obvious to me that I needed more contact than I, than I was getting. So I started to structure it in the way I would structure an exercise or mealtime, and instead of just leaving it to chance. So if, for example, by two o'clock I hadn't had some sort of social meeting or social contact, I would leave my desk with the express purpose of being with people and talking to people just the way you would go to the gym. I wasn't so instrumental as really a recognition that it's a biological need that we all have and that it was unhealthy for me. And it was in some ways some of the decisions were seamless. So I used to swim laps for exercise on my own. I joined a swim team so that three times a week I'd be in the locker room with my teammates. We'd have conversations about movies and books, I changed the way I kind of ran my life because right now a lot of us try to kind of budget in as much work and productive time as we can and this seems to be fluff. 
you know, people who spend time talking on their porch to the neighbor or, you know, women who check up on each other by telephone. It, this seems to many people to be a waste of time, but actually we're learning that the opposite is true. So it really depends on where you shift your lens. If you're looking at, you know, how many emails you answer in a day, how many uh, hours you bill in a day, that's one kind of metric. But if you look at how healthy a person is, how many doctors visits, uh, and in fact, how many chronic diseases and how long they live, that's a completely different and equally valuable, and I would say even more valuable metric. So um, it's a question of looking at the trade-offs between each one.